Uh, this program is uh, supported by the efforts of the Arts Foundation of Cape Cod, the Cape Cod Five Cents Savings Bank Charitable Foundation Trust, Glenn and Sheila Lamont, the Peacot Hill Trust, the Inn at the Oaks, Attorney Karen Underhill, and Paul Kaloris. And I take you now to Henry Beston's Cape Cod. <clears throat> Touch the earth, love the earth, honor the earth, her plains, her valleys, her hills, her seas. Enrich your spirit in our solitary places. For the gifts of life are the earth, and they are given to all. And they are the song of birds at daybreak, of Ryan and the bear, and dawn seen over the ocean beach. That was the voice of Henry Beston. The Cape Cod National Seashore was established in 1961. Beston's house was honored as a literary landmark in 64. And it was cited as one of the reasons for the existence of the National Seashore especially at this ceremony. We're here today, Governor Endicott Peabody. Partly because you've given the American people a heightened awareness of the value of the outer beach of Cape Cod as a part of our inheritance. And you've described our great beach here and the ocean which comes in upon it as no one else ever could or ever will. The uttermost house, as a testament, has had immeasurable influence. Your book is one of the reasons that the Cape Cod National Seashore exists today to protect the beach and many acres around it for our future generations. Our man, who had been up here for the first time, had selected a quotation from the outermost house. And in such a few words, it summarized this rather thick report that had first come in. These words, I think, are very apt. Outermost cliff and solitary dunes, the plain of ocean and the far bright rims of the world, meadowland and marsh and ancient moor, this is the outer cave. And it took us several chapters of a report just to say this. As we, as we went along, we found that much of our work was picked up again in Mr. Beston's book. The Outermost House, the book, by the way, that was the last voice you heard there was uh, George Palmer. He was representing the United States Department of the Interior and uh, se the, uh, Interior Secretary Stuart Udall that day. Uh, at Coast Guard Beach when Beston was honored. Uh, the Outermost House, how many of you here have read the book? Okay, anybody ever see the house itself? Oh wow, okay, anybody ever go inside it? No. Oh okay, once in a while I get somebody who was lucky enough. Is uh, still long gone, long gone, Blizzard of 78. Uh, this uh, image you see before you was a sketch done by one of Henry Beston's very good friends. It was a fellow named Maurice Day, better known as Jake. He was, a, he was an illustrator and he did some images for Henry's early fairy tale books. <coughs> but uh, he also went on to work for Walt Disney and he drew a character you might have heard of named Bambi. So this is the, uh, maybe this is the Bambi version of the outermost house that you see before you. The New York Times in 1993 described The Outermost House as a passionate book about winds, tides, seabirds, and stars, and what it's like to fall in love with a beach. His lovely beach is lovely still. On most foggy afternoons, the beach has not a soul, but Henry Beston's on it. And that all is describing The Outermost House, which was published in October of 1928, and that's what the original cover of it looked like. And it's never been out of print since. Uh, dozens of editions, and it's still one of the, it's probably the top seller at the Cape Cod National Seashores bookstore, along with a book called Cape Cod that was written by another Henry, a guy named uh, Thoreau. And uh, I'll get to that in a little, in a little bit. Um, this, this picture you see in front of you, 
uh, is on the front of most of the additions you see now of the outermost house. And uh, it was taken by a woman named Nan Turner Waldron, who wrote a book called Journey to Outermost House, and it was published in 1991. Um, Nan stayed at Henry Beston's Outermost House as a guest of the Massachusetts Audubon Society from 1961 every year for at least a couple of weeks until 1977. So she calculated that she probably stayed there as much as Henry Beston did. And during all that time, Nan, who was living in, lived in Sharon for a good deal of her adult life, uh, Nan was basically my outermost house guru. I, I met her in just before 2000 and talked with her at great length on several occasions and she had been battling cancer and she told me, she called me up in September and said, Don, my cancer's back and there's really nothing I, I can do about it. Uh, she says, but I want you to come over, there's some stuff I want, you, I want to give you. And it ended up being a binder of slides slide film that she took. The binder was really thick, about this thick. I still have it and we're, we use it as a lot of the images you see here tonight uh, will be in this presentation. They're from Nan. And her research, she did unbelievable amounts of research and a lot of that you can find in Journey to Outermost House as well, which was a uh, self-published book by the way. And Nan died in November of 2000, but she had given all that all these archival materials to me. So that led myself and my wife, Nita, to co-found the Henry Beston Society in 2002. We figured we had enough to go with. As was mentioned earlier, I'd also done a magazine project for East Ham. Uh, that led to my book, Henry Beston's Cape Cod, which was written in, published in 2003. And a new edition of it was published last summer, uh, in July of, two, of 2013. That's available here tonight after the program. We've been involved in a lot of other things since. We had a uh, program where an actor from New York came up and portrayed Henry Beston in a one-man uh, performance. Uh, Marvin Einhorn, who sadly just passed away a couple of weeks ago at uh, the age of 93. <clears throat> Marvin was, uh, he did this uh, one-man act of Henry Beston for quite a few years. Actually got permission from Henry Beston himself to do the performance. Marvin was working as a director for the Today Show and uh, NBC Nightly News and uh, Mr. Wizard back in the 60s. Uh, we've also had uh, part, we collaborated with the Cape Cod Museum of Natural History in uh, 2008 for an exhibit, A Sense of Place, the works of Beston, John Hay, and Robert Finch. Um, at, our long-term goal is to have a museum that looks something like this. We have a lot of archival materials too and artifacts, I'll get to that. We've done these lectures all over the place. Uh, I've lost count, we're beyond 100 at this point. Uh, at the Cape Cod National Seashore a few years ago, we had over 160 people in their auditorium. Uh, and I've done this to crowds of plus 100 on many occasions. Uh, on Cape Cod and across New England, I've led walks at the Cape Cod National Seashore, outermost house related. Um, in fact, next week I'll be taking eight or nine coastal ecology students from Franklin Pierce University who are reading The Outermost House as part of their curriculum and I will be uh, telling them all about it as we walk down the beach next week. Uh, artifacts, we have many. Nan Turner Waldron's family gave us uh, a window from The Outermost House, uh, the bird feeder, we also went to auction over the last few years. A lot of Henry Beston's material became available in an auction and uh, Henry Beston's walking stick, uh, his binoculars, his coffee mug from the outermost house, his backpack rack, uh, his camera and kerosene lamp and inkwell. And then of course there's our documentary film project which you will see some rough cut footage of tonight. During the, during the course of uh, this program. The director for our film is Christopher Seifert of Moon Cusser Films in Chatham. Chris has worked with the likes of Julie Harris and Walter Cronkite on Cape Cod documentaries and is now also producing a film about the writer Edward Gorey. 
and he's gone all over the Cape. We've rented small shacks and cottages out on the Outer Cape to get that outermost house feel. He's showing me here in a, in a outermost house type cottage of uh, what he shot that morning at uh, LeCount Hollow in Wellfleet of a sunrise. And we, you'll see some of that in our footage later on. We have a best in actor to do reenactments, a fellow named Chris Kolb, who you might have seen in the beginning in some of the footage we were showing before the program. Uh, luck had it, the day we were shooting out in Wellfleet, a nice big fog bank came in and added to the effect. Uh, this only Henry Beston would have loved. Uh, Chris Seifert also got himself a residency at the Ray Wells Dune Shack in Provincetown last year. And we went out there and shot both at night and at, during the day. And this was taken in the Ray Wells Dune Shack at night when uh, that, that, any light you see there, not much of it's coming from that lamp. Most of it came from the camera flash there. It gets very, very dark out there on the outer beach. And then we had to, the actor and I had to make our way back through the dunes because we couldn't stay the night. So we made our way back through the dunes in the dark, which was quite a feat in itself. Um, we, t we did take quite a bit of scenic shots, uh, scenic footage out there. And everything was in bloom, which was really nice. And there's the dune shack out in the back. And this, this is just, you know, you have to get this really good, breathtaking, high definition nature scenery to go along with the historic footage that we have and photos that we have. This is a, Chris went up in the airplane and got some really good footage of above Beston's beach there. We also went out in the nor'easters and like Beston would have and this was in a storm about the week after Hurricane Sandy hit. And this was almost as bad, this storm. And this is on Nauset Beach in Orleans. And I'm the poor soul who had to stand there and hold the umbrella and protect the cameraman from the blasting wind and sand that was coming off the ocean. Uh, quite a workout in itself. And even one of the old shipwrecks became uncovered, which really added to, gave us a nice effect. We've interviewed a lot of writers for this. This is David Gessner, and we have yet to really mix his video footage in yet. He's a pretty well-known Cape Cod writer. Uh, I also interviewed Robert Finch last month. Bless you. Uh, also, Joan Anderson has been interviewed for this film, uh, along with Daniel Payne, who's working on a uh, biography about Henry Beston, and that's due out sometime this year. And we've also been recording music. We have to have a musical soundtrack. So that's been, uh, that's been in the works as well. And I'll show you some of that's how that's been going. Just a very short sample. That was recorded at the First Congregational Church of Chatham. It's one of those old 1700s congregational churches. The acoustics in there are just absolutely beautiful. The last pianist you saw there, Jacqueline Schwab, you might recognize her name from some of Ken Burns' documentaries. She's played piano on baseball and Civil War and some of his other films. So that's, uh, that's a feather in our cap right there that we were able to obtain her services for this film. Now let's get on the road to the outermost house. Uh, it all started in, on June 1st, 1888, when Henry Beston Sheehan was born in Quincy. And Henry's the little tyke there in the middle, <laughs> sitting down, wearing what appears to be a dress. Uh, he was the son of, the second son of Dr. Joseph Sheehan, who I'm told is one of the founders of Quincy Hospital. His mother, was a, uh, his mother was of French descent, 
So he grew up in a bilingual household. He spoke French and English equally well, and he really identified more with his French side. And his brother, Dr. George Sheehan, who was also a pretty well-known doctor in Quincy, and worked in a Boston hospital later on with another well-known Cape Cod writer who had the doctor in his title, Dr. Wyman Richardson, who wrote The House on Nauset Marsh. And Henry was a Harvard boy. He went to Harvard, graduated from Harvard in 1909 and then with a master's in 1911. He is in the front row, the third one seated. And every, you might see what looks like women in back of him there. That they're, they're not women. Uh, it, it must have been hasty pudding week or something. Uh, he graduated from Harvard and then he taught in France for a while at the University of Lyon and came back to the States and took a job at Harvard in the English department. But war broke out in Europe and identifying so closely with his mother and her French side, he wanted to help the cause there. The United States was not involved in the war yet in 1915. And he decided he couldn't join as a soldier for either the American or French forces because of his, he had really bad astigmatism. So he had to do the next best thing and he felt and he joined up with the American Field Service as an ambulance driver. Now a lot of other well-known literary, literary figures also served as ambulance drivers. Ernest Hemingway, uh, E.E. E. Cummings among them. But he uh, also later on after his service in France as an ambulance driver, he also served uh, aboard naval vessels as a correspondent for the U.S. Navy. Uh, both destroyers and submarines and the like. And he came back and he was really scarred by this whole experience, particularly from what he saw in France. And especially from all that indifference to human pain and suffering. Uh, this video features um, Gary Lawless, who is the caretaker of Beston's house, Chimney Farm House up in Maine, and Dr. Daniel Payne, the biographer of... Uh, who he wrote two books about his World War I experiences. And he has a book called The Volunteer Poilu that's about being an ambulance driver at the Battle of Verdun. Mm -hmm. And the descriptions that he has in there are incredibly detailed, but they're horrible, just mm -hmm. horrifying things that he was seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a detail of, of a human heart that's caught in a thorn bush. Mm -hmm. He saw some awful stuff. I mean, yeah. wholesale slaughter. And, and just that indifference to, to human pain and suffering. And, and he had been talking to a French soldier, and the soldier was very, very anxious to hear what the people back in the United States thought. You know, do they think we'll win the war? Uh, do you think the United States will enter the war? So he and Henry, who could of course be fluent French, um, talked at some length about American attitudes in the war. Just then they hear a shell coming in. They dive for cover. When passes, it explodes nearby. When Henry gets up, he looks back, and there he sees the soldier with the left side of his chest torn open and the blood dripping down his arm, the heart exposed. That was the first death that he saw close up during the war. He made a rather uh, grim jest about the, uh, the artillery fire. He said that at the, uh, the Bois de Petra, all the new American ambu uh, ambulance volunteers. So they had a two-week crash course in identifying shells. And at the end of the two weeks, those who passed the course went to the funeral of those who didn't. He also was, um, was profoundly affected by the, the memories of what happened during the war, what he had seen, what he had witnessed. And one of the interesting things is that he doesn't show that so much early on. And I think that was because, you know, uh, both as an ambulance driver and then later as a correspondent, correspondent, he was so busy that you don't have time to reflect very much about what you're doing. You always have a job to do. But as the years went by and he thought more and more about what modern industrial civilization was doing, uh, he became uh, very disillusioned about it. Uh, he said that, that war had become a business, 
with the um, citizenry as the stockholders and with the um, purpose of doing maximum inflicting maximum damage on the on the enemy and this would include of course civilian populations so I think the more he he got a little distance from the war oddly enough the more it's really started bothering him um, and he became somewhat pessimistic about what was going on in Western civilization uh, mainly due to you know things like industrialization and how that affected us in terms of our violent tendencies and uh, he later said on several occasions that it was in an effort to recover from his experience in the war that he turned to writing children's stories fairy tales world war one is really a huge part of this story because he was ended up on the beach looking for some peace of mind he was haunted by the by the war uh, experience for years and it really took a while before it, he could even really start to shake it um, as dr payne mentioned he uh, took to writing fairy tales and he wrote a couple of really charming books uh, very well written fairy tales uh, one which he dedicated to his very good friend colonel theodore roosevelt jr the president's son and but fairy tales as much as they always have a happy ending they're not real so he had to still work towards something else he wasn't there yet and he wrote a few more books and he wandered around quite a bit uh, traveled extensively actually this was in new mexico where he became very friendly with a navajo indian medicine man and he also went about Europe quite a bit, and I think this was in Spain. And take a look at him there on the right. I mean, what a dashing-looking guy. I mean, he just had that Errol Flynn, Omar Sharif kind of thing going on. Um, but after the war, he had come back to the States and took a job in New York as an editor at the Living Age magazine. It, was, it had just been bought by the Atlantic Monthly. And... It didn't take long before he realized he hated this job. It, it was something that, you know, he said editing is a treadmill pro profession and it chains one to his desk. And I can relate. I've been in newspapers for 30 years almost. And yes, that can happen. It gets, it gets rather tough after a while. And he started, he got out of that job and he started taking some more writing assignments. And one of them in 1923, took him to what he called the Cape of the Wild Houseless Outer Shore. It was an assignment for the World's Work magazine, the Wardens of Cape Cod, and it was about the Coast Guards of the Outer Cape, from Provincetown all the way down to Monomoy, where they would patrol the beach at these stations that were set up. It was formerly known as the Life Saving Service and had only become the Coast Guard just a few years earlier. And he really admired what these men were doing because they were like soldiers in the war. They were putting their lives on the line. This was a dangerous job. And when you're out patrolling the beach because you never know what's going to happen out there, especially at night, it's very dangerous. And I've even talked to people who have been there and have had that job. And it's, it's not a great experience uh, as far as safety is concerned. But he really said it was one of the greatest experiences he ever had on land. He really admired what they were doing putting their lives on the line, and he went out and walked with them for miles. They would have to go six miles on their patrols. And he wrote this article called The Wardens of Cape Cod in 1923, and he said at the beginning of it, there are two Cape Cods in the world, one of the picturesque and familiar land of toy windmills, picnickers, and motorists, the other the Cape which the sailors see, the Cape of the wild, houseless outer shore, the countless tragic wrecks, the sandbars, and the shoals. So right here, he knew he was on to something. And he started staying down there quite a bit, rented some houses in East Ham, and eventually had a small house built out on the beach just south of the Coast Guard Station in uh, East Ham, the Dawson Coast Guard Station. He had a house built uh, on the dune top, and he called it the Folksel. And for an address, he just put latitude and longitude because it was so far out there. And 
beautiful, sturdy little house that was built out there. Uh, tw 20 by 16 in size, had 10 windows. So when you're out there, and this is how he got his water, was this pump, uh, this pipe that he drove right into the dune. And eventually that pipe came up through the house. And here's what it looked like, standing there on the dune, beautiful location. And that gives you an even better idea of how remote it was. And so appropriately named the forecastle because it was like being aboard a ship, really, with all these windows and all the water right in front of you on top of the dune. And I particularly like this photograph. This shows it was only about 20 feet from the high water mark, which he was warned about. And can't you just picture this photo in a Cape Cod real estate newspaper ad nowadays? A beautiful seaside shanty, $3.2 million. <laughs> it was built by uh, this fellow here, Harvey Moore, probably the only carpenter in East Ham at that time. And Harvey and a crew of about four or five other men took about a month or so in June of 1925 and built this house. They hauled it down, bricks, wood and all, on horse cart, down through the, on the beach, two miles, Finally, he got to a point where Henry pointed to the top of the dune and said, this is where I want it. And, he and Harvey said, you'll float away one day. <laughs> and he was warned by some of his Coast Guard friends too, you know, but he didn't care. This is where he wanted to be. And he was in his element here. He originally intended this only to be a place where it was like a writer's retreat for him. He'd come down here every so often. And that's what he started doing in September or the summer of 1925. But as time went on, he found himself wanting to hang out here more and more frequently, especially with all these walks he would go on. And the place just, it just possessed him after a while. And he'd go out in the, in the rough weather too, in the nor'easters, particularly loved talking about how he walked through a sleet storm. And that's rough. Um, and sometimes he'd just meditate on the surf. He, his chapter, The Headlong Wave in the Outermost House, really reads like a meditative, uh, just a meditation on the waves. So he really transformed him, and he wrote in his journal in 1926 that he had become a writer naturalist. Nature is my, my world. And he said that living on the Cape has brought out in me a mystic something that shows surprise of life to be quite the biggest thing. And he never really talked about the war in the pages of the Outermost House. In fact, he never really even talked about himself so much. It was the experience, everything that surrounded him. His only neighbors were the Coast Guards up to his north. And this was the old station. The, uh, the one that's there now was built in 1936. So this is the old one. This is underwater now, this location. Uh, living out there was great, but it was not without a share of tragedy. Um, he wrote about the wreck of the Montclair in the pages of the Outermost House where everybody on board was killed when, this, when the Montclair ran aground off of Nauset Beach in Orleans. There was another instance that he didn't write about in the Outermost House. It was uh, the wreck of the Pioneer, actually the fire on the Pioneer. It caught fire and the crew had to be rescued by the Coast Guards and Henry saw this happen out at sea and they came ashore but more closer to the sh where Beston's house was rather than the Coast Guard station because of the wind. So these guys were all, many of them badly burned, brought ashore, brought into the house. Henry helped fix them up as best he could, gave them what food he could, uh, going through his cupboard and everything. And they were very appreciative of a little bit of soup and other things. Also the hot wine toddies that he was able to scrape together. They liked that a lot. Uh, he was one of the boys, as far as the Coast Guards were concerned, had his own uniform, which he wore around quite proudly. And he used to do these little sketches. He said they were something to amuse the ladies, is what he called it. Uh, this is one of him walking on the beach to the forecastle with his backpack and his walking stick. We used this in our logo, actually, for a while. Um, Another one in a letter that he wrote to George and Mary Smith, friends of his who were light keepers at Highland Light. And this vegetable stand in East Ham, feed them and stuff them grocers, I always liked that. And labeled the bright red on the asparagus. Um, his home away from home 
in East Ham. He didn't, let me, let me kill one legend here right now. He didn't stay a straight year at the Folksal. It really kind of came and went over the course of two, two and a half years. And well, they, they say the same thing about Henry David Thoreau. He didn't stay at his place all the time either, his little cabin. So he stayed sometimes at the Overlook Inn, which is now known as Inn at the Oaks. It's across kind of diagonally from the uh, Salt Pond Visitor Center in East Ham. And now it's surrounded by trees. Back in those days, there were no trees. So you could see out to the ocean, to the beach, very well from there, and also out to the bay in the back of the, of the building. So this came in handy as a way for Henry to signal for his weekly <coughs> rides into town to get supplies. He would go back and forth with Tom Kelly, the, uh, the innkeeper. Mr. Kelly and, he, and Henry both knew Morse code. So they would signal each other with lanterns from the beach all the way up to the Overlook. And they'd go back and forth to doing this on a regular basis. Well, this, this uh, sparked a little bit of gossip within East Ham because, remember, this was the 1920s. This was during Prohibition. A lot of people thought that uh, Henry was signaling when he was going to bring in his next load of cargo, <laughs> so to speak. Not really the case. Although Henry did admit to sheltering a rum runner or two while they were running from the Coast Guard because uh, he, he said he considered prohibition an infamy. He got some writing done out there, but not a heck of a lot. But most of it happened afterwards. Um, he did complete a chapter called Night on a Great Beach, and this came out in the Atlantic Monthly in, 1920, in 1928, early 28, I believe. But... He did end up making a book, he said, calling it The Outermost House, The Moods of the Sky and Outer Ocean, Tides and Rhythms of Nature in the Years One Sees Them in a Great Elemental Place. What the mind makes of it, musing alone, these are its concerns. So he had finally found some peace for himself. And when his book came out, it did fairly well. Uh, not a bestseller, but it always sold consistently well over the years. This is what one of the old early covers looked like. He said this one was too sinister looking. Uh, the experience he had out there, he talked about especially being out there in winter, and I found it interesting that he noted being without the hindrance and interferences of man, and that no one came to kill, no one came to explore, no one even came to see. So he was in a good place now, uh, mentally. And his writing, he's, one of his old friends told me uh, that writing and nature were synonymous with him. And his book, The Outermost House, is constantly compared with Thoreau's Cape Cod, but according to Thomas Lann, who wrote This Incomparable Land, he said, The Outermost House is a talismanic book of solitude, comparable to Thoreau's Walden and Edward Abbey's Desert Solitaire. And... When The Outermost House first came out, Beston wrote to his wife and said, uh, I am now the Thoreau Burrow, co comparing himself to Henry David Thoreau and John Burroughs. But over the years, the comparisons really started to come in a lot. And he really started to hate the comparison, particularly with Cape Cod and The Outermost House. He, uh, he ended up writing an introduction to Cape Cod in 1951. And he wrote a letter to his friend saying how he had just done this. And he said, it always seemed to me a very dull book. He said, but I did my best for the other Henry. And there were a lot of similarities between the two of them. They had, both had musical instruments at their uh, respective cottages. Uh, Thoreau had his flute. Uh, Beston played a concertina. They were both born in the Boston area. Both spent a lot of time on Cape Cod and later in Maine and Canada. Neither one used their given names in their work. They both went to Harvard and both were of French descent. But by the time the 1960s rolled around, Beston was saying, I admire Thoreau, but don't care much for him. He wasn't warm enough. And believe it or not, the Thoreau Society people were really good sports about that last year when I spoke to them. Um, 
Beston didn't seem to mind, though, when he was awarded the Emerson Thoreau Medal American, by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, the only other recipients prior to him were Robert Frost and Beston's Harvard classmate, T.S. Eliot. Beston said, if I tie with anybody, it's with Richard Jeffries. Uh, both of us are scholars with a poetic joy in the visible world. And reading Jeffrey's writing, it's very similar to what you might see in the outermost house. Meston got his writing done at the forecastle at this desk. Uh, he would only really like to use a number two pencil. He preferred that to, he said the fountain pen was heresy. And the typewriter, he said, I can't write with that. It's uh, the, the clickety clack sound, it just throws off my rhythm. And uh, so he would get, and a lot of times stuck on a single sentence, he'd spend the whole morning on a single sentence before he would move on. So he would get frustrated and throw the papers over his shoulder and his wife always knew when he had a bad morning because he'd have a whole pile of paper on the floor behind him. He said though that nature was quite a teacher for him though. He said sentences ought to follow each other like waves of the sea and be as individual as waves. A sentence ought to come in at a fair speed, rise, break, and then withdraw leaving a free space for its successor. And The Outermost House was even published in a French edition, much to Henry's delight. Is it uh, available? Uh, yeah, well, you can find it in um, uh, maybe abe.com, antique book dealers and things like that. Maybe some used bookstores might find it. Um, not an easy find. Um, it's, that translates into a house at the end of the world. And Henry read that and he read the French edition and he said, it's even better in French than it is in English. <laughs> His work influenced a lot of writers over the years, uh, especially even nowadays with Robert Finch and um, David Gessner and so many others. But one of the biggest influences was on Rachel Carson. Rachel Carson said the, the Outermost House was the only book to ever influence her writing and that she kept a copy of it on her nightstand to remind her of what good writing was. She actually became very friendly with Henry and his wife Elizabeth uh, during her later years. Um, I'll take you on a quick tour inside and outside of the outermost house. This is an aerial view and the dark areas you see, the one on the bottom is the Atlantic, up top is Nauset Marsh, and then that little circle up in there, there's a little house right in there. That's where the forecastle was in its third location. It had to be moved twice over the years. Um, Robert Finch said it was probably the only national literary, traveling national literary landmark in existence. <laughs> this is what it looked like though in its final setting. Nan Waldron took all these photos. Um, and this sh just shows you where it was uh, if you're familiar with Coast Guard Beach, you can see the Coast Guard Station up there in the distance to the northwest. And these are just some of the great photos that Nan had. This was actually on the cover of her book. And of course, living there during the fall is an, a great experience in itself. And now we'll just uh, take a walk up inside. Go up the steps on the porch and through the doors, really well-built house. Uh, Harvey Moore did not skimp. Henry drew up the plans himself for this house, and Harvey built well. Um, those are my words, those are Henry's. Um, there was originally a hearth fireplace. The second time they moved it, they ended up putting in a wood stove. And there were two rooms. One was a, consisted of a living room area and a kitchen area. You can see the pump there coming up into a sink basin. And the view, and you can see on the far left there, that's a refrigerator. Mass Audubon put in a gas-powered refrigerator, which Nan Waldron, Nan Waldron told me it hardly ever worked. So it really wasn't very helpful. Um, they actually would put in extra beds too to accommodate more people. The, the shelves were crammed with books. We have a lot of those uh, that we picked up in the auction as well. And of course there was the one little bedroom where Henry would only sleep when it was warmer. He didn't, otherwise he slept by the fire. He said he would have froze otherwise. And this is the writing desk area and with the kerosene lamp. 
And the chair, Henry found it on the beach, took it, took it back to the house, painted it blue, kept it there all those years. When the house washed away in 78, lo and behold, the chair washed ashore again. And now <laughs> Mass Audubon has it on display. Uh, when you're living at the beach like this, now here's, here's the sunrise time of day, and you can see the ocean there on the right, and Beston's house is right there on the left, still kind of in the shadows. And when you're living that close to the ocean, and it starts acting like this, you want to get out. Because things like this happened. In 1933, there was 20 feet of sand in front of the house before this storm. And you saw the photo from earlier, the one that looked like a newspaper ad. Well, here's how it looked after that storm. Hanging on the edge, practically. Henry was living in Hingham at the time. He went down to check out what was going on, and this is what he found. He went in, he started taking stuff out of the house, because he was afraid it was going to drop into the drink right then and there. He was lucky it did not. Uh, there was only a few feet to spare, though. He had it moved back. Eleven years later, had to have it moved again because of, of erosion. And when you're living in a house like this, in Dune Shack, sand can be a problem. Uh, it piles up on your porch, it gets in underneath the shingles, even if the place is locked up tight. The people in dune shacks have told me that. Uh, I, know, I know a guy who goes up every spring and cleans out some of the dune shacks. He says he goes in there and he finds all kinds of sand all over the place, but they're locked up tight. It's, a, it's, a, it's tough out there. Uh, but flooding is the big problem, uh, especially with the outermost house. Um, and there it is, uh, surrounded by water, and, well, that's what it ended up turning into. Um, Nan Turner Waldron was staying there in May of 1977. Uh, and a storm acted up uh, that was not forecast. So she left that day and came back the next day after the storm subsided. And she said she had to wade in water up to her shoulders to get into the house. So at this point, it was living on borrowed time. It wasn't going to be long now. That was in 77. So when it's surrounded like this, every time you get a bad storm, problems will come up. Um, I'll get back to that in a, in a minute. Um, but when Henry Beston left the beach finally in September of 1927, he'd been going out there for a couple of years, and he went back to Quincy and met up with his longtime lady friend, Elizabeth Coatsworth. And he was talking marriage at this point. He was all rejuvenated and wanted to start his life now and uh, wanted to marry this woman that he had been with so, so long. Well, Elizabeth knew what a good writer he was, and she wasn't too bad herself. But she wanted to see something from him being gone all this time. He had been out on the beach a lot in the last couple of years. And she said to him, where is your book? He said, well, I've got a lot of notes, but I don't really have a manuscript yet. But you've got to write a book. This is, and, it, and it kind of went back and forth as the story goes. Book, marriage, book, marriage. <coughs> Guess who won that argument? Uh, finally, Elizabeth said, no book, no marriage. And that was in September of 1927. The manuscript was done in April of 1928, <laughs> seven months later. So yes, it, had, it was a, quite the motivating tool. And they were, the book came out in October of 1928. They were married in June of 1929, lived in Hingham for a while at this beautiful old house overlooking Hingham Harbor called Shipcoat is what the house was called. And uh, I saw it listed about 10 years ago for about $3 million. It was, it's quite the house, and it's right over the harbor. It's a beautiful place. But Henry didn't like this whole suburban thing that was going on. He really wanted to be, be able to go out and, uh, you know, if, if he wanted to get any, out anywhere around the Hingham area, he'd have to go to Blue Hills or places like that. So he, um, his friend Jake Day, the Bambi illustrator, told him about a house that was for sale in Maine. Jake Day had his own uh, houseboat on Demerascotta Lake. And this house was in Nobleboro, which is where the one end of the lake comes down to. And he knew about this farmhouse being for sale, so Henry bought it. 
and he just loved the idea of going and living at this beautiful old farmhouse. And his wife thought, yeah, that sounds fine, okay. So they moved in part-time for the next, this was in 1931. And they lived there part-time for the next 13 years and then went there full-time until Henry died in 1968. And Henry was in his element here, but it would be another seven years before he wrote another book. 1928, The Outermost House came out. It was not until 1935 that Herbs in the Earth, which was about his experiences in his herb garden in his attic here at the farmhouse came out. Some good stuff in this book. He never ever reached the same level that he was writing at uh, when he wrote The Outermost House. Shortly after The Outermost House was published, he had a contract to do another book about the Cape. And he started writing it. He started doing a couple of chapters on oh, eeling at the salt pond and the kettle ponds and things like that. And Dan Payne had actually read some of it that wasn't destroyed. Uh, he said there were some scraps left and he said it was really good stuff. And Henry was at the height of his writing powers, but he did not want to taint the outermost house with another Cape book. He, he, was really, he knew how good the outermost house was. He didn't want to taint it, and he tore up everything he wrote, except for maybe a few little scraps that Dan managed to see. And then it wasn't until 1935 that he wrote another book, uh, Herbs in the Earth, and he wrote a few more, one called the St. Lawrence about traveling through Canada, another uh, northern farm about his ex experiences as a gentleman farmer in, uh, living in Maine in Nobleboro, about 40 miles northeast of uh, Brunswick. Off, and the house was about three miles off of Route 1. And he and Elizabeth had two daughters, Meg and Kate, both now deceased. Kate passed away just last year. <clears throat> and beautiful old farmhouse. And it's still, now Gary Lawless, the gentleman who was talking about the war earlier in the program, uh, is the caretaker there and they do hold some events there and it's being taken care of now through conservation easements. Um, Henry died in 1968 after he had he had a, a couple of strokes in the late 50s early 60s and had to use a walker and then eventually a wheelchair to get around and his health really deteriorated after that just before his 80th birthday in 1968 he died Elizabeth lived there until 1986, when she died at the age of 93. But before Henry passed away, uh, forces were at work here in Massachusetts to honor him at Coast Guard Beach, and you heard it at the beginning of the program from Governor Peabody and from uh, George Palmer of the Department of the Interior that the outermost house was one of the reasons that the Cape Cod National Seashore exists today. It was at uh, this ceremony, which was thrown together only in a matter of weeks before it happened. Uh, there was anywhere between 200 and 2,000 people at this event. It depends on who you ask. <laughs> Most people have rounded it out to about 1,000. And Beston actually read from the outermost house at the end of the program. That's what you heard at the very beginning of the program with the waves coming in. Uh, and there was not a dry eye in the house, from what I've been told, uh, at this event. And the Bestons referred to this as the coronation, because Henry was finally being recognized for his work, uh, really at a high level. And he was afraid he would not be remembered, and this ensured that he would be. Um, and the press was there like crazy. And Cape Cod Standard Times, the Cape Codder went crazy with their coverage on it. Uh, it was Henry Beston Day in East Ham and everyone was there. And they, after the ceremony, which was held in the front of the Coast Guard station at the little amphitheater that's, that's there, they took uh, Beston and his wife and a lot of the dignitaries that were there down in by way of uh, beach buggies. And it was here that uh, the guy who drove Beston down told me that uh, the whole time they were riding, Beston was talking about the Greenheads and how much he hated them and was using a uh, share of four-letter words to describe them. <laughs> they, were, they gave Henry a special plaque uh, 
that he, he took home to Maine. Uh, it said, The Outermost House, in which Henry Best, an author naturalist, wrote his classic book by that name, wherein he sought the great truth and found it in the nature of man. And I was talking about this with Robert Finch last month, and he was, he was looking at it and kind of saying to me, well, what does that mean? I said, well, you know what happened? It was because uh, Ivan Sandroff from the Worcester Telegram and Gazette, who wrote it, uh, had to do it in 30 words or less. So <laughs> that's what he came up with for, for the plaque. And they also put one on the house itself, which they did recover after the storm. And so the outermost house really made its way around through some members of Congress and other officials in Washington while they were making the case for the legislation on the way to it being honored in 1964. And here's the point of views of, of a lot of people. We'll be talking to, with Bill Burke, historian at the seashore, Daniel Payne again, and Jonathan Moore, who was an assistant to Senator Leverett Saltonstall, who worked on the uh, legislation with John F. Kennedy. Especially an inspiration to National Park Service uh, managers in Washington and other officials contemplating the, the importance of the uh, The outermost house, uh, I think, had a, had a great deal of influence in gathering public opinion and the opinion of some rather influential politicians um, to save that, that, that land uh, where the outermost house mm. and the, the great outer beach were. Uh, a lot of people working in the park on the seashore didn't know the book or, or didn't talk about the book if they knew about it. But among a number of us, it was like a, uh, a validation uh, of what we were up to. I mean, you were. It was an inspiration. It was banked. It wasn't passion, but it was present. And uh, a number of us talked about it, and there are references to it. I can't. I mean, I know so. And Richardson, <coughs> Richardson, and I used to talk about the yeah, outermost house a lot. And I and I know that Sultan still mentioned it. A great deal to Henry too, mm -hmm. because it was a tribute to him <coughs> and his efforts. He was also very involved in establishing or uh, writing letters about the establishment of a seashore pack. Sure. He was uh, very happy about that and he was happy to have uh, the salute from the public yes. because the people came out really to yes. pay tribute they to him. They certainly did. And it was uh, a special occasion. <laughs> All right, fast forward to 1978, February. You all remember that snowstorm we might have had? How many of you were in this area? Okay, getting buried. Um, anybody on the Cape for it? Okay, it wasn't quite the snow event down there. It was more of a tidal event. Because in, on the Cape, it, it turned to rain very quickly. Although the winds were something else and the tides, well, that would, that's for the record books. This, this photo of the forecastle was taken the day before the storm hit. February 5th, 1978. May be the very last photo ever taken of the outermost house. This is what the beach looked like. It had really developed quite a bit. Uh, everybody wanted to have an outermost house. It was a cottage of colonies, kind of like they had at Chatham in recent years and sort of like the dune shacks that are out in Provincetown now. Uh, this shows the bathhouse that was there at Coast Guard Beach. That's no longer there. And the forecast for that day was, uh, this is a pretty routine nor'easter kind of forecast. Uh, 8 to 16 inches of snow, uh, 25 to 40 mile an hour winds. No big deal, right? Uh, well, this is what happened, and this is the one now that all other storms are measured up against. Uh, the, when they're going nuts over a snowstorm on television, they're always thinking of this one, particularly people like Harvey Leonard or any of the other meteorologists. Uh, they remember what it was like. Um, the high tide at new moon caused uh, the water to be 14 and, feet, 14 and a half feet above mean low water four feet above normal. So it's already a very high ocean. 
And then you've got winds that were 92 miles an hour officially. They said at Chatham it was more like 120 before the wind gauge gave out. And the bathhouse and the parking lot at Coast Guard Beach were completely destroyed. And a 15, 50 foot long concrete septic tank was unearthed near the bathhouse. So that shows you what nature's power can do. Now speaking of TV meteorology, here's the satellite photo. Uh, that little bit of dry air that's, you can see this storm had an eye. And there on the right, you can see Cape Cod is actually in the clear, while the South Shore in Boston and everywhere else in Massachusetts is getting clobbered with those bands of snow coming across. Cape Cod was sitting in the clear for two or three hours, and the sun was out, and temperature went into the 40s, the wind was calm, and everybody up here is getting hammered. Well, down there, they were going to the beach to watch the show because here's what was happening. This is, the, this is as seen from the Coast Guard station. The entire barrier beach was overrun, and including all of those houses and the, uh, the bathhouse, which had to be burned down because it was so badly destroyed. Uh, even a week later, there were still breaks in the, in, the, uh, in the barrier beach, and houses were floating around in Nauset Marsh, John Hay, the nature writer, was there that day, and he told David Gessner that um, he said he saw all these little cottages floating around, and it looked like they had eyes as they were bobbing up and down in the marsh. And eventually, a lot of them got taken out into the uh, surf and broke up, including Beston's house. And this was part of it that floated right by Hemingway Landing, and it was taken by this picture was taken by a woman named Marilyn Schofield who was uh, her great -grand her grandfather, I believe, happened to be one of the Coast Guard officers who told Beston, your house is too close to the high water line. <laughs> and parts of it ended up at Fort Hill. Some of, them came ashore, some of it came ashore in Orleans. And they recovered bits of the house, including the dedication plaque. Now they couldn't keep a lot of the house because there, it was broken up and splintered. It was really a hazard. But people have kept shingles and pieces of wood, and we have some of those. Um, this is a before and after the storm. Up top is how it looked before the storm. Down below, just the flat sand and a few posts sticking up with the ocean in the background there. It's like low tide on one of the bay beaches. <coughs> Nan Waldron was able to get down there a week later after the storm from Sharon. And uh, this is what she found on the Orleans side, parts of the floor. She actually found the water pump. And this, and she also found the window, which we now have. And this map, it's on the left shows 1925, the part on the right shows present day. The red dot is where the outermost house was on the beach. So you can see where it was, about two miles south of the Coast Guard station, just before the Orleans border. And now <clears throat> that beach has a, the uh, inlet opening has migrated substantially north. And that inlet tends to move quite a bit. And you can see where the outermost house was underwater. So a lot of people might ask the rangers, where's the outermost house or where was it? They'll say, well, I'll tell you what, you walk to the end of Coast Guard Beach and then walk some more, because that's where it is, out in the, under the waves. Uh, Mass Audubon sent out a letter that week telling people they're members that the outermost house is gone and that they would not try to uh, rebuild it. Nan Waldron wrote this in uh, her book, Journey to Outermost House. The, the, uh, the outermost house, she figured it was going to be forgotten about. That wasn't the case. Uh, and then she said that uh, Beston's Sensitive understanding of man's need to recapture his relationship with the total environment is a timeless message, something which every human can seek no matter where he or she roams. The world of the outermost house is really a microcosm, an, outer, an anywhere world, which is different things to different people. Anybody have any questions?